Welcome to Design Your Life in Business, the podcast for leaders by Bright Mind Consulting Group. We give you the necessary tools to help you become the architect of not just your business, but your life too. I'm your host, Javon Wooden. Hey, what's going on, Chase? How you doing, man? I'm awesome, Javon. Glad to be here, man. Thanks for having me. A pleasure and honor to have you, man. So we're going to hop right into it. I know today we want to talk about doing good and doing well, how brand purpose drives business growth. This is an awesome topic, especially in today's climate. So I'm excited to dive into it, man. Amen. (laughs) All right. First question I ask every guest is, who are you? Who is Chase Friedman? Man, that's a great question, but always the hardest, right? How do you sum it up succinctly? Look, I've had a lot of pivots in my career. I actually started as a storyteller, as a filmmaker. So working as a writer, director, producer, and independent film and TV, that was my passion. That was my purpose until it wasn't, until I realized I got to find something a little more sustainable. But the thing that stuck with me always is the passion for telling stories, right? For me, I kind of migrated that into consulting and working with brands and businesses to help them tell their stories, right? It's more critical than ever. Uh, but how are you going to stand out in the marketplace? How are you going to cut through that white noise? What is that compelling message and story behind what you do? And more importantly, why you do it? So from filmmaker to consultant to now you know, running my own agency for the last seven years, seven-figure agency, Vanquish Media Group, that's what we champion and we do. Everything from helping develop brand identity and voice all the way through the execution of identity of your website, design and development, through the digital marketing tactics you need to kind of grow. But again, start with that purpose and identifying that singular story and clarity. Absolutely. And I love the name Vanquish, man. So how did you come up with your brand identity and the brand name? That's a great question. So look, I'm a little bit like most entrepreneurs, kind of the barefoot cobbler, right? We're really good at doing for others and we don't always help ourselves out, right? So I'm last in line. But for me, my kind of mantra, right, is to help empower people and businesses to do good and do well, to profit with purpose. Because a lot of people think, oh, okay, well, if you're a purpose-driven organization, that means you're a nonprofit. Not the case. They are not mutually exclusive. You can have it all. You can do both. It's been a journey of self-discovery. You know, when I started my agency, I think like a lot of entrepreneurs, you're saying yes to a lot of different things, a lot of different clients, trying to build your name. Very quickly, I realized that, you know, look, the world has enough branding and digital marketing agencies. What was going to help me set apart? And more importantly, what was I doing it for, right? What was going to make, what was giving me the passion and purpose behind the work? And it, did, it took some soul searching. And for me, my personal purpose is to empower others to have greater impact and clarity in their lives in the world. And when it comes to building a brand, building a business, those are skills, those are superpowers that I know how to kind of work with. So it quickly became Vanquish myself helping empower these purpose-driven organizations to develop that purpose and that passion and that clarity, right? I think any sort of purpose-driven brand has to come from within, whether that's the leader or your internal team and stakeholders. A lot of people like to kind of get on social media, get on a platform and preach, right? And say, this is what I'm about. And this is all the good I'm going to do in the world. Start in your house right? Start with your core. Start from the inside out. It's easier to promise than to practice. So my journey has been one of self-discovery. I'm constantly learning and absorbing more, but this is a movement. This is a space that I'm excited about, right? We are seeing a monumental shift in the way people work, the way people buy, the way people support businesses and brands. And a lot of this is kind of enlightenment and showing business leaders and entrepreneurs there is a more purposeful way forward beyond the singular bottom line. Absolutely, man. I love how you stated that. And we're now seeing that most of the successful brands, well, if not all successful brands that you know and love today, they have a social cause that they present. And many of the ads and the commercials and all those, they're kind of tying that in. So to say, okay, we're Google, but we also believe in getting Wi-Fi and connectivity for all. We're on cloud, but we want to give shoe people in Africa, you know, stuff like that social cause. So people that are seeing that, they may not really readily identify that, but how do you define brand purpose and why is that important for business, especially now? That's a great question. So, you know, from my vantage point, 
brand purpose really starts with your why, right? Why do you exist in the world? What do you believe? And more importantly, from a business standpoint, what is the impact you seek in your organization, in your community, in society, at the world at large, beyond the bottom line, right? What is that you want to see and be in the world? And I don't just mean, hey, we want to sell shoes. We want to sell consumer products or whether you're B2C or B2B, right? Purpose is a deeper meaning of why we exist and what we believe. And you've got to start there. Otherwise, you know, you get a lot of this quote unquote purpose washing, right? A lot of people that it's easy to have a great, fabulous, aspirational mission statement, but how are you activating on that? And consumers are more savvy. They will call your bluff. They can see through the BS if you are for real or, for, or not. So purpose is all around that deeper core, that deeper meaning of why you exist. And everything else stems from there, right? Knowing your why. And then how you are uniquely positioned and equipped to deliver that value in the world. And then the what, right? It's just the products and services you're selling. But hopefully those are all aligned, right? And again, as I mentioned to you, the proof is there. It's not just the sounding good, right? We've seen companies been around for a while, Patagonia, Google, On Air. A lot of companies that have been doing this for quite some time is kind of what a lot of people look at is, oh, that sounds good. That feels nice. But it's driving significant business growth, right? So to throw a couple stats at you, you know, and this is at all levels, consumers, they're four to six times more likely to purchase, protect, and champion purpose-driven companies that align with their values, right? Four to six more times likely. Wow. We love stats over here at Design Life and Business, by the way. Okay, I'm going to throw a few more at you because, again, I think that's important to understand that this is not just a value signaling exercise. This is not to just to tell a good story and say you're doing good on social. But if you prove it and you have a commitment towards it, you will not only increase margin and market share for the reasons and stats I just shared with you, customer engagement, loyalty, employee engagement, retention, right? So kind of going through a couple others. So 82% of consumers make purchase decisions with purpose in mind, right? But brands are still trying to put it into practice. Every two in three consumers are willing to pay more, pay a premium for products and services from brands that stand behind a certain social impact. So if you're looking at, you're going to the grocery store and you're looking at all these brands or the shoe store, whatever it is, and you've got a lot of different options at your disposal, what's the one that's going to stand out, right? You know, something that signals a deeper meaning and people buy on emotion, right? So what's going to stand out to me as a consumer? And then if you get into, talent recruitment. We've gone through this great resignation, quiet quitting. I mean, companies are losing billions of dollars in company churn and, and turnover. We get it as presuming we're kind of in the millennial realm, right? So 77% of millennials say invest, of investors say ESG, environmental, social governance are their top priority for investment opportunities. And millennials are going to make up 75% of the workforce by 2025, all right? Which is scary. But they're looking to work for socially responsible employers, right? One more, 83% of them would be more loyal employees to a company that helps them contribute to social environmental issues. So investment, employee retention, consumer, why wouldn't you want to lean in on this thing right now? Yeah, and that's a great question for the designers listening who are running organizations. What causes, not are you just championing, but what do you really stand for? You know, it's like you have to put that out there these days or else people don't really align with you because they're looking for that value buy, not values as in pricing, but values as in what do you stand for and who you are as an organization and you're a personal brand as a person. And I think that really matters. And we see a lot of companies have some missteps. So when you have those missteps, what do you do if you don't live up to that stated purpose as a brand? That's a really good question. I wish I had like my PR protege on the side here, like crisis management. You know, look, I can't prescribe to you steps to kind of retroactively help fix that. The tried and true methods are always be real, be authentic. You see a lot of companies that get into some hot water, whether it's through greenwashing or different forms of purpose washing, which basically just means you're saying you're doing something good, but you're not actually doing it, right? And companies are starting to get the hair slapped around it. You got to own up. You cannot hide behind, you know, your missteps. Everyone makes them. But the quicker, the faster you are to show up, 
for your employees, for your consumers on social media and own up to it and say, hey, mea culpa, you know, we made a misstep, but we're really determined to make it right. No one expects you to get it right every time, right? It's tough in this era of cancel culture, but that is why if you can use your North Star, your guiding kind of mantra and purpose and passion for all elements of your brand strategy, of your digital marketing tactics, of your company culture, and constantly looking back and measuring that, not just putting it up on the wall to kind of look good and sound good, it will usually steer you towards kind of a path of doing right by your stakeholders. And I say stakeholders, meaning your internal employees and your external customers, right? We're in this kind of time where a few decades ago, this was historically more of a shareholder driven capitalism. How can I drive bottom line numbers for my shareholders and board? Now it's a stakeholder driven economy and capitalism. The power is with the people that work for and purchase those brands. And what are we doing to align and support them? 100%. I think you said it right, man. Just being your authentic self, being transparent, you know, owning up and fessing up. And for brands, Sometimes it's not even a fault of your own. You know, these larger companies, they get in trouble for third parties they work with. We've seen it a few years ago with uh, Nike. When they were coming up, they had got into some trouble. If you read Shoe Dog, Phil Knight talks about this. They got into some trouble because one of the suppliers had like a sweatshop going on. And Nike, like, we weren't sure. We went out there. We seen how it worked. We thought we did all the due diligence and come to find out this was happening. So that's why it's so important to be authentic and be transparent. And really, instead of trying to spin things for the good, really just say, hey, you know what? We're going to make it right. We're going to fix it. And that's a great opportunity to really connect with those people who are on your side to say, we know we messed up and we want to connect with you. We want some of your feedback. You know, what would you like to see from us? You know, getting that engagement because the people who know, like and trust you, if you mess up, they're more than willing to say, hey, this is what we would like to see. They're more than willing to provide their feedback. They actually love that. And that's one of the things that I love about consumership is, hey, they want to be involved. They want to feel like they're a part of your organization and what you have going on, no matter how large of an organization you are. So I think that's a great way to look at it. Just own up and fess up and then hear from. Be ready to take those questions. Be ready to hear from the people that buy your products or your services and apply that. Don't just fall on deaf ears. Apply it to your organization and what you're doing. So I love what you just said there, Chase. Yeah, man, you're spot on. I mean, I think the biggest key, especially that's hard for a lot of leaders, is listening, right? But really hearing what people are saying, you know, being willing to be vulnerable is hard. And no one wants to kind of look foolish and say, we made a bad move. But if you can be vulnerable with yourself, especially with your teammates and your company and your consumers, and truly listen, they will respect and value for that. You know, talk about building brand loyalty. If you're ex company that has just gotten by with, being the lowest cost provider and you make a misstep, right? Say a Walmart. I don't want to pick a Walmart. They do some good stuff too. But imagine a consumer that has always purchased from them because it was the cheapest option. And if they do something to offend or misalign with their values, that's kind of a lifelong kind of excommunicado. You're out. Versus a company that has continued to build trust, build loyalty, build brand affinity, a relationship, emotional relationship and connection, right? to that consumer, hey, you mess up, but I still believe in what you stand for. And that aligns with what I stand for. And we can get past this. I think it's not easy, but the more you invest in this, the more it will pay dividends. And this is something that's hard for companies in a down economy. How do we invest in give back programs and societal do good when we're just trying to make a buck? Well, look, if you stay the course and trust the process, the data doesn't lie. It is going to allow you to succeed and thrive versus those that are completely on the outside. They're destined to fail. 100%. And a lot of times, it's not even the monetary things. It's about you know that time invested. You know, We're seeing a lot of companies starting to add the benefit of, hey, if you do volunteerism, we'll actually give you some time. We'll pay for that time that you're doing that volunteer work as a way to kind of offset some of that. So there's really some interesting ways that you can kind of tie that into your employee benefits and really show those employees that, hey, we really do practice what we preach and we're going to back it up. Yes, you're paying in a way, but let's be honest, employees, there's a lot of lost time, lost man hours. So why not just give some of that time towards a cause? And think about it. I mean, how good would that feel as an employee 
versus another day of Skype, Zoom meetings, whatever. You're investing your time in something that you can feel good about as a person. And hey, that came through my employer, my job. That's just building greater alignment, right? So I agree. Look, when I say purpose and doing good, that doesn't mean you have to change the world, save the earth, all these big things. I think a lot of companies get a little bit fearful and anxious about, well, what does that mean for us? Does that mean we've got to solve global warming? No, everyone can do their part from the lowest ground level. And that's what's exciting. I'm not on the front lines of a lot of these environmental social issues, but I know my role is to help empower and guide and provide clarity for those who are. And that by proxy, you know, makes me feel good. We're a partner of 1% for the planet. You know, 1% of our revenue goes to global kind of health organizations, but also a part of that can be done through pro bono and a volunteer work, right? Which we do as well. So there's many ways to contribute. It doesn't always mean something big and expensive. And you said it earlier, you said pretty much start inside, start where you are, all right? And that's one of the best things you can do is looking at yourself and really refining how you do things, your processes. You know, if you're a packaging company, looking at how we can reduce our waste, that's already doing something great, all right? So you can really look at how you're doing things, you know, your carbon footprint, all these different ways, and then you can start to branch out and find different opportunities and ways and partnerships and things like that. So I love that. That's a great way and very innovative way to do it. So so thank you for mentioning that. So I recently went through a rebrand, right? And, you know, rebrands, a lot of people associate what they see as the brand, right? So how does an organization, whether they're starting or they're rebranding, how do they ensure that their brand purpose is not lost in that transition? Awesome question. And I'm not too far off my own rebrand myself. I mean, we always kind of go through iterations, right? The one thing to clarify is a logo is not your brand, right? The visual identity is not your brand. Even the messaging alone is not your brand, right? The brand, quite frankly, is how your audience, your customers perceive you. And a lot of that is uncontrollable. But once again, you know, the fact that people perceive and buy, you know, through emotion and kind of intuition and a lot of their subconscious, that's to me, the brand starts with, again, that kind of golden circle paradigm of your why, your how, and your what, you know, why you exist and what you believe, how you are uniquely positioned for it, and what you are offering and providing the world to make good on it. That to me is a core crux from which we work with one, everything from your brand core. So those elements and kind of the stuff that's internal, your brand positioning. Okay. So how do we take that and position that to our consumers in the marketplace for our unique sort of message? And then brand personality, the voice and tone you use, getting into brand archetypes, right? You know, these are tried and true scientific and storytelling devices that have existed for long before we were here to inspire people to believe, to action, to pray, to whatever it might be, using kind of those innate skills that are and quite frankly, storytelling skills is a big part of it, but it's the culmination of things, right? But always starting with a clear identification and clear message of who you are as a brand, why you exist, and letting that inform, well, what does that look like, right? What are the visuals behind that? Okay, awesome. How are we going to deploy that to our audience? What sort of tactics are we going to use to serve and market to our customers? It's ambiguous, but you've got to start, I believe, in a sequential approach. That's why for us, we, go, we start with discovery, you know, getting clear and vulnerable with who you are, building the identity, now the outward facing portion of it, and then growth, right? We're not starting what social media campaign is on trend or what influencer we should be working with. It's got to be from the inside out. Absolutely. Uh, and that's the only way to get it right. Because if you do the other way, if you start letting everything that is influencing you externally dictate that brand, then you're going to be very lost and it's not going to come off authentic and you're just going to be doing whatever's clever at that moment. And it's just not, you're not going to last. So if you're doing that designer, stop. Yeah. You'll be due for another rebrand in six months when things change. Right. You know, like, Oh, I thought that looked cool six months ago. Like we all get that. But if it's tied to a deeper kind of commitment and why and purpose, then that's got staying power. That's got lasting power. Right. And we see it all the time. Right. If you go on LinkedIn right now, you know, people, there were brands who focus on something like a storytelling or they were a speaker that focused on DEI. And now all of a sudden everyone rebranded to be focused on 
marketing and they're focused on AI. So we see that, you know, that whatever's clever happened and those types of brands, they're just not going to last. Now it can become a piece of your, what you do, but it should not become your brand. That's a clarification and distinction we're looking to make here. So you mentioned earlier, you talked about how brand purpose kind of aligns and ties into the internal, the employees and how it's perceived just from a people perspective holistically. So how do you relate your brand purpose to the company culture? You know, again, going back to listening, right? What we see a lot is what we what's considered kind of a purpose paradox, right? You see purportedly the C-suite leadership develops this really kind of incredible, intricate purpose and mission behind the company. As you go down the ranks, middle management, even HR, kind of your actual boots on the ground workforce, there's a gap, there's a disconnect, right? Maybe they've heard it in a memo or posted somewhere, but it's not really connecting and resonating, right? So again, being able to listen to your own team, your own internal stakeholders, first and foremost, to not just say, well, this is what I believe and this is what we're going to stand for as a company. But try to weave in what do you love doing about what do you love doing in your job, right? What gives you joy? What makes you proud to work at this company, right? Listening and trying to incorporate as much as you can. Now, you can't have too many cooks in the kitchen, but try to be mindful of not just crafting something in a silo and then spreading it out and saying, hey, everybody, go preach the gospel. It's just not going to work. So if you get people to invest in it, they're going to be your best brand ambassadors. Forget about influencers. Like if you can get your own people on LinkedIn that love and are excited by your message to go share it, like you've got your team, your squad, your soldiers at the ready because we're all drinking the Kool-Aid together. You said it best, man. That was uh, beautifully stated. You know, if you can create evangelists, brand evangelists without having to do anything, you're just being you, you are winning as an organization. I think that's what we all want. So you said it correct. So what are some key strategies when you identify your brand growth objectives to tie those in with the brand purpose? Great question. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we want some measurables and KPIs to help us with that. Now, that's a hurdle. You know, it's hard to measure the long-term impact of true like societal cultural change, right? Today, even the largest companies that have a lot of resources against it struggle with how do we measure the ROI of our commitment to do good, right? Of our brand impact. And the reality is, is you no, know, you got to start by really unpacking what it is you think is important to measure, okay? You have to kind of reverse engineer something. If you're trying to create change, such as, well, we're our company, you know, employees, we have a lot of churn and turnover and lack of productivity. Okay, well, what's leading to that? All right. Maybe we're measuring the time spent with people engaged in doing work outside of the job, the volunteer, the pro bono work, right? How many hours and resources can we allocate towards that? How engaged are people in kind of our communication and our events and our company culture? And then obviously measuring, okay six months from now, what does our turnover retention look like once you've implemented this kind of campaign? So it's not a fast ROI, it's more longitudinal, but it will take effect. There's a multitude of things you can measure. But again, the methodology is be very clear with what you need to be measuring, you know, put a baseline metric in place now. So getting a read of the company, hey, what are we doing now, good and bad and the ugly? And let's continue to monitor and have check-ins along the way so that we can adjust. Not every strategy is going to be bulletproof, right? Some of it will work, some of it won't. You need to optimize that as well. Look, I'm not a data guy by trade. I get overwhelmed by the data and the metrics. So start small, start really, really simple. And a lot of companies don't have those protocols in place, but there's more and more tools that are out there that are really changing the game. So it's not just what's my view and engagement rate, my click-through rate, my website traffic. There's things that can give you some, you know, Plus Media is doing something like that. They're a great partner that track really more lasting societal impact and change from some of these commitments. And then some of the low tech ideas, you know, we talk about Google Trends and Talkwalker alerts and things like that. Just seeing what is being stated about your brand to really tell you what your brand is being known for right now or noticed for right now. So start where you are, like Chase said earlier. That's a great way to brand listening tools absolutely are solid and brand 24 is a great one. And again, reading the pulse from a broader standpoint, but also 
like you mentioned earlier, if you're a logistics company, start by being a little bit more efficient in your process and your systems internally in-house, ask your employees, right? Do some kind of periodic check-ins, sit down. Hey, how do you feel? How are you doing? How can we do better? What do you need to see more of? And starting to see and feel that change happening. Yeah, those climate surveys are important. You know, they're not just lip service, man. You get a lot yeah. of data from doing that. So question, we're talking a lot about this and I know the designers are probably asking, so what are some of the pitfalls or, or challenges that organizations could face when they try to align purpose and profit? What are some of the pitfalls? Well, I'll tell you, I think one of the biggest things is that knee jerk reaction when things are not going well, right? In kind of with the company, the bottom line. It's very easy, you know, well, it's not easy. Say you set out with a strategy and a commitment to purpose, right? And all of a sudden you don't hit your Q1 metrics and up, oh, we got to scrap that. We got to focus mean and mean on just hitting our, our revenues and target goals. That's not the time to bail. If anything, it's the time to double down. It's not easy. I've been there. My agency, my company, we've been brought to our knees, quite frankly, in some of the roller coaster of running an agency and, and this economy. But arguably at our lowest is when I doubled down on what we were about and who we wanted to work with, right? I looked at an opportunity to kind of clean the slate and say, all right, let's be more intentional about how we can work and how we can serve. A lot of large companies have these big initiatives and departments, whether it's DEI or corporate social responsibility or ESG. And they're, when times are good and the COVID pandemic woke them up to that, and now in kind of a down economy and sort of recession, they're like, oh. We got to shut down that whole initiative. It's not working for us anymore. We got to get down the brass tacks. Guess what? They'll be back in another two quarters, a year at most, doubling back down on that because it's not a light switch. You can't turn purpose on and off when it's convenient for you. So that to me is a pitfall that we're seeing a lot of. And as you well know, as you called out, consumers are far more savvy than ever before. They see it. They know when you're just saying it or when you're willing to walk the walk, the good times and the bad. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better, man. And it's, there's a fine line between what we're talking about and that sustainability aspect. You know, a lot of these organizations, there is a part of their R&D. Let's just call it what it is, where they're trying all these different initiatives. They're like, oh, that's a great idea. We have a surplus of cash, you know, fits in the budget. Oh, we can get a tax write off for this. You know, so there's a lot of that going so I want the designers to know, even if you aren't in business, you know, that's something that you have to pay attention to. You know, it's not that organizations just want to cut all these employees and all these things. But when things are going well, you have more cash flow to do things like that. Right. But if you want to sustain long term, right, you like you said, you got to get back down to brass tacks. What are the rudimentary things that you need to be doing to just function? Right. Just function on the daily to ride the tide, so to speak. And then when you're back in that growth phase, then you can look to go and do those things. But what we're talking about here, that brand purpose, that's going to you're going to see that regardless of where we are in the economy. Right. A brand is going to show you that even if they're not doing all these crazy, cool things at that time, just look for that. That's the way you're going to really know what a brand is all about. Right. Down yeah. I mean, it, wouldn't you rather go down swinging for something you believe in you in a cause you want to fight for than going down, just not standing for anything at all. It's like businesses succeed and fail and grow and shrink every single day. But, and as we've talked about purpose being a great conduit for business growth, but look, stuff happens at the end of the day, as a business owner, as a designer, as an entrepreneur, feeling good about the work you're doing and the impact you're making in your own life, your team's life. That to me is, I think the driving motivator and factor with the success and or failure of your business, knowing that you were doing something, leaving a legacy and doing something more than just trying to make a profit. Absolutely. You said it right, said it beautifully as you've been doing this whole episode, man. So we're going to switch gears here and we're going to go to the by design segment where I ask every guest the same three questions. Are you ready, Chase? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So what has been the hardest part about designing a life and business that you don't need a vacation from? That's a tough question. And I love it. And I even prep because I've listened to your show and I know the hardest part about it, you know, is again, this journey that I'm on and there is no there. It's finding a deeper meaning in the work that I'm doing. Right. It's hard. You know, I'm constantly, I've got two young kids trying to raise a family, grow a business. Finding that balance is hard no matter what, but willing to be vulnerable with myself and say, 
what is it that's important to me? What matters? What's kind of my purpose and why behind the work that I do? Connecting the dots. It used to be, all right, well, I hope I can do well in my personal life and my professional life. Well, those are pretty integrated. So I better be clear on what's going to give me joy on both sides. That's been the toughest thing. It's really facing myself in the mirror and saying, stop trying to be all things to all people. How can you best serve with the you know, greatest intention? And I don't have all the answers yet, but I'm committed to getting there. So I think we both have the hardest part. We share that. <laughs> so, yeah, right? Yeah, the lonely endeavor, too. man. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow, that was awesome, man. That, I felt that one for sure. What is the best lesson you've learned on your entrepreneurial journey so far? I've had a few. I'm staring, not intentionally looking away. I'm staring at my wall. I've got four kind of mantras that my former mentor whose path kind of instilled in me. I haven't had many mentors. I know people are like, oh, I have a mentor for this. I haven't had that network, but when it's come to me, I've been grateful for it. So one of, he would used to say, and I believe in this is get your mind right. Some of us wake up every day, every other day, some days, and we're just like, I don't feel like it. I'm tired. I'm burnt out. I don't want to do it. You know, don't have that intrinsic motivation, but like the need to just get your mind right with a positive mental attitude to approach, be optimistic, be that strength for sure yourself, but you know, your team, your clients. Another one is stay uncomfortable, right? I think that's where true kind of growth happens, not playing in the safe space and the comfort space, but stay uncomfortable, getting comfortable in the discomfort. And then the other one, you know, this is like the buzzword. It's like a drinking game. How many times are saying it, but define your definite major purpose, right? It's true. You know, I, he used to say this to me all the time and I'm like, what are you talking about? Like where I want to live or what I want to have? No, it's, it's a deeper thing. And so what is your purpose in life, in your career, and how that kind of flavors everything else, right? Otherwise, we're just kind of churning the wheel, hoping that we're going to get somewhere good without kind of that compass in hand. Those are a few of them. And the one to sum it all up is you ask for one, I give you a lot. I love this, man. Come on, keep going. The last one that he would say all the time is, and I say, and my five-year-old says it to me all the time, which is like the biggest blessing, living the dream. Like, you know, that we are. Like, whether you've got a good day or a crap day, take a breath. Look at all you have to be grateful for, right? Like, we are living the dream in this time, this age, this life. We get to be on a podcast together from miles apart and run a business and help others do the same. I mean, living the dream. That's a military term. Was your uh, mentor military? He was. <laughs> always Marine. That. Yeah, that's a military term right there, man. There you go. I didn't even know that connection, but good for calling it out. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. We always say that. That's good, man. And that does tie it in because, you know, people will think we're saying it sarcastically, but like you said, you literally are living the dream. It's another day. Right? You are blessed to have an opportunity, no matter what your circumstances are. You are blessed to have an opportunity. That's those small wins early on, practicing gratitude, you know, getting a routine, a habit of gratitude and gratefulness and positivity really makes a difference in the rest of your day. It is not easy. Just like exercise and building muscle mass, like you got to work it every day. Every freaking day. And then the <laughs> days you aren't doing it, you got to be still feeding into it some way, shape or form, right? So what are three tools or tips that you would recommend when scaling a business? Again, this kind of goes back to a little bit of like, you know, definite major purpose in Napoleon Hill, building your mastermind alliance, you know, as he terms it, but your team, right? I think that's the most important thing is surrounding yourself with people that are stronger and smarter and better than you in different areas and checking ego at the door, surrounding yourself by people that make you better. I think that's, and, and help drive you. That's the first thing. Second thing I would say, again, not to be redundant here, but have that definite major purpose. What do you want to achieve in your business, right? Singular, qualitative and quantitative. I want to get to say, you know, a million dollars and five years. And here's how I'm going to do it. Know what you're aiming for versus I want to grow a company. That'd be nice. And what does there look like? So kind of and writing that down, right? Being really honest and clear. It's kind of setting goals, right? Third thing is learning to be patient and compassionate with yourself. It's tough and it can be a, a lonely endeavor, whether you're running your own business or you've got a full team behind you. There's this expectation, I think a lot in our culture where as the founder, CEO, leader, you're expected of all the answers. It's not possible. So like you mentioned it earlier, what happens when you, 
don't know if I'm about to curse on the show, F up. What happens when you fuck up, right? It's inevitable. I've spent plenty of time beating myself up over it and saying, oh my God, like I'm a failure. I'm an imposter syndrome, all that stuff creeps up. So trying to be compassionate with yourself. And again, I'm certainly not there. I'm trying to be better every day. And that's part of the process too. And I think that's just a part of the entrepreneurial journey and journey of life as a whole, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, is really discovering, right? There's no manual to life, no manual to business that we wish there were sometimes. But when you do things, you know, especially as an entrepreneur, you're very a risk taker in some way, shape or form to get to that growth stage, that next level. So you're going to mess up, but that's how we have to change it from that loss to that lesson perspective. And I always say, I don't expect to be great. I don't expect to have the answers. I aspire, right? And that really, that shift really helps me to say, okay, I couldn't have expected. I've never done it before, right? I can't, you know, expect things to just work magically if I've never done it. So I aspire. I mean, that really helps me when I get down on myself. I like that a lot. I like that. I'm going to borrow that. You know, yeah, man. man, you can have it. Bro. <laughs> you <Yeah>. can have it. <laughs> well, Chase, really appreciate you coming on, man. You dropped a lot of knowledge. This has been an awesome conversation. How can the designers connect with you? Find me on LinkedIn, Chase Friedman. That's the place to kind of see what I'm up to and working on, I'm trying to communicate most there. And you can visit us at vanquishmediagroup.com. And that's our website. That's kind of representation of you know our process, who we've worked with, our capabilities, our impact, how we try and serve and do better each day. So yeah, Vanquish Media Group and Chase Friedman on LinkedIn. Awesome, man. Love what you Vanquish Media and you are all about. And I look forward to seeing what you have coming up, man. And the designers, remember, keep ascending. Do not stop dreaming. Do not stop doing and continue to believe in you. All right. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Thanks, Javon. Appreciate it. Design Your Life and Business, the podcast for leaders, is brought to you by Bright Mind Consulting Group. To find out more about Bright Mind Consulting Group and how you can become the best leader possible, visit brightmindconsultinggroup.com. Make sure you search for Design Your Life and Business on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Bright Mind Consulting Group, we cannot thank you enough for listening.